Hi, welcome to Discovery of the W Boson, Part 1. In this two-part series, we'll talk about the discovery of the W Boson by the UA1 and UA2 experiments reported in 1983. The W boson is one of the mediators of the electroweak interaction and is a critical component of the standard model. The formulation of the electroweak theory, which predicted the W and Z bosons, earned Glashow, Weinberg, and Salam the Nobel Prize in 1979. The discovery of the W and Z bosons by UA1 and UA2 earned Simon van der Meer and Carlo Rubia the Nobel Prize in 1984. In this video, we'll give some background info on how the W interacts with the quarks and leptons in the standard model. In part two, we'll use that knowledge to talk about what UA1 and UA2 did and the results they obtained. Okay, so first, let's take a look at the particle content of the standard model. We have six quarks, six leptons, the gauge bosons, which are the photon Z, W plus and minus, and the gluons, and the Higgs boson. So, in this video, we'll be looking at how the W interacts with the quarks and leptons. Now, before we get started, I should make a boring preliminary note. The Think Like a Physicist audience contains physicists and non-physicists. In particular, I'm pretty sure we have some physics students who sometimes watch these videos. Now, there are details about the interactions of the W with quarks and leptons that are very important if you want to do a calculation and very important for other observables, but not so important for getting an idea of how the W was discovered. So, there are a couple of ways that I could choose to handle these details. I could choose to include them, or I could choose to leave them out. If I include them, the video will be too long and complicated, and it will add a lot of complications that we don't really need for understanding how the W was discovered. But if I leave them out, the video might mislead physics students who need to know the details for other purposes or to do a calculation. So, for the physics students in the audience, in this video we'll only be looking at those features of the interactions of the W with quarks and leptons that are immediately relevant to the W discovery, and we'll be glossing over a lot of important topics. In particular, if you're interested in the SU2 cross U1 electroweak model, or quark or lepton masses and mixings, or the CKM matrix, or parity violation, then the description that I give here of W interactions with the quarks and leptons will be too simplistic for you. I'll be giving an oversimplified description of the interactions of the W with quarks and leptons. Later, I'll give a couple of slides mentioning places where the complications arise. And now, for the non-physicists in the audience, I'll just say that I'm leaving out some details about how the W interacts with the quarks and leptons. These details are physically very important, but not needed for having a good idea of how the W was discovered. And for both the physicists and non-physicists, if anything about this is confusing, just ask questions. Okay. So now we're ready to talk about the interactions of the W boson with quarks and leptons. So, we have six quarks and six leptons. The quarks and leptons are each arranged into three families, shown here with the large parentheses. For the quarks, 
each family has an up-type quark with a charge of plus two-thirds. These are called the up, charm, and top quarks, respectively. Each family also has a down-type quark with a charge of minus one-third. These are called the down, strange, and bottom quarks, respectively. For the leptons, each family has a neutrino, which has zero electric charge. And there's also a lepton in each family with a charge of minus one. These are the electron, muon, and tau, respectively. Note that in every set of parentheses, the upper entry has a charge that is one greater than that of the lower entry. This is true for both the quarks and the leptons. The quarks on top have a charge of plus two thirds, which is one more than the charge of those on the bottom, minus one third. And the neutrinos on top have a charge of zero, which is one more than the charge of the leptons on the bottom, which is minus one. This is not a coincidence, and we will come back to this. Okay, so as we saw, the quarks and leptons are each arranged into three families. But what determines how they are paired? For example, why is the partner of the up quark, the down quark, and not the bottom quark? And the answer is, it's related to how they interact with the electroweak bosons W and Z. Okay, so let's look at the first family, which contains the up and down quarks. The up quark has a charge of plus two thirds, and the down quark has a charge of minus one third. This pairing, whether you're talking about the quarks or the leptons, is called a doublet. Okay, now let's see how these quarks interact with the W plus and W minus bosons, which have a charge of plus or minus one. We can write down an interaction where an up quark emits a W plus and transforms into a down quark. This same interaction can show up in different processes. So here, the way I've drawn these diagrams we should read each of them from left to right. And we're using the convention that antiparticle lines are drawn with their arrows reversed. So in the first diagram, we have an up quark coming in and it emits a W plus and turns into a down quark. In the second diagram, we have an up quark and a down type anti quark colliding to produce a W plus. And in the third diagram, we have a W plus decaying to an up quark and a down type anti quark. And I should note that there are also other possibilities not shown. Now there are analogous interactions for the other quarks and leptons. So here, we showed the interaction of the up and down quarks with a W. The story is the same for the charm and strange quarks, and the top and bottom quarks. It is also the same for the leptons. An electrically neutral electron neutrino can emit a W plus and turn into an electron. There is an analogous interaction between a muon neutrino and a muon, and one between the tau neutrino and the tau. Okay, so now I'll briefly describe the complications that arise with what I just said. If the stuff I say on the next two slides makes no sense to you, do not worry. We don't need it for talking about the W discovery but it should be included here for the sake of accuracy. So the interaction of the W with the quarks and leptons exhibits something called parity violation. It only interacts with the left-handed 
and not the right-handed quarks and leptons. Everything that I've said above about quarks and leptons falling into doublets is only true for the left-handed quarks and leptons. Now, massive quarks and leptons have left and right-handed components. If you look at the mass eigenstates, things will get more complicated than what I've described here. In the case of the quarks, you need to look at the CKM matrix, and in the case of the leptons, you get neutrino mixing. Now, these issues are very important, but we don't need to talk about them here. Okay, so, so far, we've seen that the W interacts with all of the quark and lepton doublets in the same way, and also it's with the same strength. Let's use this knowledge to make a quick prediction that we can test against observation. So let's look at something called the branching fractions of the W. If we produce a W boson, it can decay to quark anti quark or lepton anti lepton pairs. So let's ask a question. What fraction of the time should it decay to each possible final state? These fractions are called branching fractions. Okay, so here we show diagrams for the process of a W plus disintegrating into a quark anti quark or lepton anti lepton pair. The diagrams for disintegration into quarks are in the top row, and those for leptons are in the bottom. Now, the first thing to mention is that the top quark is heavier, actually much heavier than the W. So the W plus basically cannot decay to a top quark and a bottom anti-quark. So that diagram doesn't count. That leaves us with five. Now the interactions marked by these blue circles are all identical. So it would seem reasonable that the W plus would decay into each of these possible final states with equal probability. That's almost right. There is a complication that each of these quarks come in three colors. So each of the quark diagrams actually represents three different final states. So if we want to get the relative rate of these decays, we need to multiply the quark rates by a factor of three. So we should expect that the ratios of the branching fractions to UD bar, CS bar, and each of the neutrino anti lepton final states have the values 3 to 3 to 1 to 1 to 1. Now, in practice, it's very difficult to tell the difference between the UD bar and CS bar final states. So they usually get lumped together into a class called hadrons. So we should expect the ratios of the rates for a W plus to go to hadrons and to each of the neutrino anti lepton final states to be six to one to one to one. That implies that the W plus would decay to hadrons two-thirds of the time, and to each of the neutrino anti-lepton final states one-ninth of the time. Now, we should note that these numbers won't be exact. There will be tiny differences due to the different masses of the quarks and leptons. Also, we could consider more complicated Feynman diagrams. Let's compare our naive expectations with the experimental results anyway. Here we see our naive expectation and the measured result for the branching fraction for W plus decaying to hadrons, nu e e plus, nu mu mu plus, and nu tau tau plus. 
our naive expectation is good to a few percent. So our naive expectation is not too shabby, especially considering that we really didn't calculate anything. Okay, so now let's talk about what's next. We've now familiarized ourselves with the interactions of a W with the quarks and leptons of the standard model. In the next video, we'll see how the UA1 and UA2 experiments first observed production of the W boson.